You gotta believe that this morning. He is in the room, present, active, and alive. So high five someone next to you and say, Jesus is in this house. He's in the room. I love the scripture, Psalm 139, 7. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Let me say that one 
Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Watch this. If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn and settle on the side of the sea, you're there. Even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Jesus is in this room right now, and we get to glorify him. Amen, amen. I'm Pastor Travis. Welcome to Hope City Church. Uh, better is one day in this house than a thousand elsewhere. I'm talking about the house of God, wherever you choose to worship. If you're online, you have a home church somewhere else. Well, God feels you that go there. But this is a good church. Just good church, just to, just to say, you know, Hope City could be a home for many of you to worship God. And if you are new or first time in a long time, if you wouldn't mind texting the word new to 717-500-3575. Also, if you have a phones in the house, there's QR codes on the seat backs in front of you. You can scan those and I get you some news and information about Hope City Church. Welcome, welcome again. Uh, we have a great service plan for you. We're going to get back into some worship. And after that, Pastor James will deliver the message for us this morning. You'll see me later in the services, give a few announcements, and then we will close you out. But I'm excited because God's in the room, and who knows what he's up to this morning. But uh, let's just uh, uh, posture our hearts to, to release and to, to receive what God has for us this morning. I'm going to pray. Father, I thank you. We're just a few are gathered in your name. You choose and want to be with us thank you for that that you're not a distant God your name is Emmanuel God is right here with us so father this morning we lay down our burdens our worries our stresses of life and say this is the best place to be in your house in your courts in your gates because you're not just good you're only good all the time every single day of the week and we get a privilege and honor of worshiping our creator this morning in Jesus name if you agree to shout amen amen thanks
those laws that we called sin in shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came, and he died, and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. Remember those giants we called death and grave? They were like mountains that stood in our way. But he came, and he died, and he rose. Those giants are dead now.
Father, we Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you that you always invite us to come. To come and worship, to come and gather, to come into your presence. That you never hide from us, but you said, Lord, that if we would just call upon your name, you would always be faithful and true and just to answer. We thank you that we know you are here with us. You're in the room with us. Your presence is with us. You never leave us nor forsake us. And if you believe it, let all the church say amen. 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 You may be seated. Thank you, worship team. And youth, just a reminder, we do have youth ministry today. So if you are in youth ministry, you can exit through the uh, back doors and uh, meet Nate out for your class today. Amen. You're good to be in the house? Glad to be here this morning. Now, everyone just seems a little bit more docile this morning, and I don't know if it's because your energy levels are low, and if it is, that's probably a good reason. We've been in a 21-day fast starting since last Sunday. So how you doing? Fantastic. Okay. <laughs> Some of us doing better than others. Some of us are so Say, come on, Jesus. Give me a little energy, a little strength. But uh, if you don't know, we've been participating in a 21-day fast. Uh, by asking the Lord, what is it that he would have us give up and sacrifice? Because we want to spend some time with Jesus, right? And uh, so uh, if you haven't jumped in on that, it's not too late. There's, you know, it's, we're doing 21 days, but if you want to jump in today, that's fine. The goal and the purpose is that we take that extra time out right here at the beginning of the year and spend it with the Lord and say, Lord, what is it that you want to do in me uh, for this upcoming year? What do you want to say to me? What do you want me to know? And... Uh, it's been, it's been a good season. It's also been really good to do devotions with you every day. We've been going live on social media, so if you haven't caught them, you can go back and watch them, but catch us online uh, every morning around 8 o'clock. You know, life happens, so sometimes it's earlier, sometimes it's later, uh, but, but catch us online throughout the day as we do 21 days with Jesus together. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. <clears throat> if you have a Bible this morning, I want to go back to the book of Genesis chapter 1, yep, the whole way back there, and I want to talk to you a little bit today about Missio Dei, which really just means the mission of God. Can everybody say the mission of God? Mission of God. And I believe that this is a new season for us at Hope City Church, and I would dare to say that this is probably the most pivotal season that we've had as a church for a long, long time. And I want to make sure that as we enter this new season and what God wants to do with us as a church, that we are building on the right foundation. Everybody just say foundation. Foundation. Foundation is important. If your foundation is off, you understand that everything else will inevitably be off, regardless of how pretty you build it, how extravagant you build it. If the foundation isn't right, eventually all the beauty will fade away and it will become unsustainable. So I want to talk a little bit today in making sure we have the right foundation and talking about the mission of God. And has it ever occurred to you that God has a mission? Sometimes we think of God and we think, well, he's just kind of ruling and reigning over everything. And we understand that, you know, God would have a general desire to see mankind saved, but I believe that God has a very specific mission, that he's aiming at something. And he's been working towards that mission, that goal, his purpose, since the very beginning of creation. So that's what I want to jump back to today, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. It's a very familiar verse of scripture, but I want to point a few things out. And it says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the, uh, the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, now be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. 
And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And it was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank that as we opened up your word and we have read your word, that Father, help us dive into it, find application for our lives. Help us to understand what the mission of God is. Help us find our place in that story and help us as a church move forward into all that you've called us to do and to be. In the name of Jesus, let the church say amen. amen. So this is the beginning of God's mission. This is God's first words both to and about mankind. His first words to and about mankind. And this is what he says, not just about Adam and Eve, but about us. He says, let them have dominion. And he says that they are very good. And he gives mankind some instruction in that. So this is important to the mission of God. Your story is not just your story, but your story is really a part of God's story. God is involved in your story, but he's really meant to be the center of our lives. He's meant to be the center that we build our lives around and that our story encompasses. And I would argue with you today that for your life to be complete, for it to ever make sense, for things to ever really connect and line up, you first have to make sure that God is first and foremost in his right position at the very top of your priority list and that your story is circled around his story. Come on, somebody. In order to do that, you need to know what God is about. You need to know what he wants. You have to understand what he's after. And you have to know what his mission is, right? right. So to put the mission of God when it concerns us into one word, I would summarize it as partnership. God wants a partnership with you, with me. He wants a partnership with mankind. He created this world and it's full of possibility, but... The possibility that's in this world can only be unlocked in partnership with mankind. I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about that later and prove it to you. But what that partnership is meant to produce is what I want to talk to you about today. So there are three things that I see here in Genesis 1. Three things that I believe are the beginning or the foundation of the mission of God. And I think you'll find that God's desire from the first page of Genesis to the last page of Revelation has not changed, yeah. that he's still after the same things. Sometimes we set goals and we don't accomplish them. Like every year we set the same New Year's resolution. But God never sets a goal that he doesn't accomplish. That's right. And what he desired to do in the beginning, he will complete it in the end. What he's looking to begin today, or to continue today, will be completed. Why? Because it's still what he's after. So I want to show you three things that I think are found in Genesis 1.28 that are foundational for the mission of God. And that's number one, if you're taking notes, multiply. Number two, expand. Number three, subdue. Multiply, expand, and subdue. I want to start with multiply real quick. The very first words of God to mankind are, hey, be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. And he's talking about procreation, but it's more than just a essence of, hey, you, you know, your species needs to survive, so you need to have some kids, Right? It's, it's more than that. It's more than God being a zookeeper looking at an endangered animals and hoping that they would mate so that they could survive. He wants more from mankind than just the survival of our species. Do you believe that? Yes. I believe what God has been after from the beginning and that we will see to what he's always been after is that he wants a family, a people. 
Be fruitful and multiply. Not just so that our, 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 you know, we can survive and that you know, we would fill the earth, but that his heart is that he would want a family and a people together with him. Amen. I think as you read through the rest of scripture, you will begin to see this concept laced throughout your Bible. That God wants a family. He wants a people. Do you remember when God shows up in Abraham's life? And what does he do to Abraham? He says, Abraham, I'm going to give you a son, but it's more than just a wish fulfillment for Abraham. It's not just saying, oh, Abraham, I know this is your, your wish and your desire, so I'm going to give it to you. He, it, he goes on to say, he, this is more than just your lifelong dream to have a son. It's not just about solving you know, Abram's problem of who's going to get his inheritance, who's he going to pass his possession down to. No, but he says to Abraham, I want to give you a son because I want to bring out a people from you. I want a family from you, Abraham. And he says, if you can look at the sand of the seashore, that's how many your offspring will be. If you can look up into the stars of the night sky and count the stars, number them if you can, because that's how your offspring will be. So what do we call Abraham? We call him the father of of many nations, the Bible says. He was the father of a people that God was going to bring out of Abraham. God has always wanted a people, a family. In the Old Testament, the people of God were defined primarily by their ethnicity and defined by their location. They were called the children of Israel, and they were the literal descendants of Abraham through Isaac. It was an ethnic community, and to, be, to belong in that community, you pretty much had to be born into that community. There were some variables for that, but overall, you had to be born into that community. But in the New Testament, that, that concept changes a little bit, and that's because of Jesus. That's why he says, I did away with the old covenant, and now I'm establishing a new covenant. Why? Because this, this new covenant is a little bit different than the old covenant. The old covenant said to be a part of the family of God, you had to be a part and an offspring of Abraham and Isaac, and you had to be a child of Israel. But in the new covenant, Jesus switches this up a little bit, and he says, now the family of God is not by a physical ethnicity, but by a spiritual ethnicity, that for all who would be born again, come on, somebody, would now be considered a part of the family of God because they were born again into the family of God. Just in case you don't know, you're not a follower of God because you, you know, know a little bit about him or you attended church most of your life. You become a child and you become a part of the family of God when you are born again. There's an experience, there's a moment, there's a thing that happens when you cross from death into life. Not because you know religion or not because you attended a seminar. It's when you make a decision and you ask God to come into your heart and you ask for forgiveness for sins and you make him Lord of your life and yes. you surrender your life to him. He says, then you are born again. Yes. And now in the New Testament, we, we, we are part of the family of God, not because we are from the offspring of Abraham, but because we were born again. Yes. But what I want you to see is the family theme remains. What God wanted to do in the Old Testament is what he's fulfilling in the New Testament, is which is bringing people into the family. Amen. And what do we call the family of God in the New Testament? In the Old Testament, it was Israel. In the New Testament, it's the church. The church are the people of God. I don't mean everybody that goes to church is the people of God. Remember, it has to be marked by being born again. Amen. Jesus looked at a rich man and said, unless you are willing to be born again, you have no part in my kingdom. That's right. But God has always bringing, been about bringing a family together. And that's what we even see in the book of Revelation. At the very end of the book, it says that God will dwell with his people. He will be their God and they will be his people. It's what he's wanted from Genesis and will fulfill in Revelation. That God will have a family. He will be with his family. He will be with his people. 
And the invitation throughout all scripture has, has been, if you want to be a part, come. Jesus made a way when the separation was there and mankind could only come through sacrifice. He sent Jesus down and said, now all you have to do is believe in my son, be born again, and the invitation is open to all. Amen. Come on, somebody. So God has always desired a people. So this has and should have significant implications about how we think about life, how we see people, how we see ourselves, and how we see the church. Why? Because you can't separate people, or excuse me, you can't separate the people of God from the work of God. You can't separate the people of God from the work of God. If I had a nickel for every time I bump into a Christian who says they love the Lord, the relationship with God is great, but they want nothing to do with the church, yeah. I'd be a pretty rich man. But God has always desired family, community. We live in the most individualistic society that has ever existed on the planet Earth. And somehow we think that we can relate to God with just us. And if that were so, he wouldn't have said back in Genesis, multiply, build a family. He wouldn't have sent his son so that he could build his family. You know, sometimes, and I'm not saying this is, 100% positive. It's just my view take on it. But, you know, you have the new earth and old earth thing where, you know, science says that the earth is so many billions of years old. But according to scripture, you know, we see that the outline and timeline of scripture would only take us back a few thousand years. And they find all these things. It, this is just me. I'm not that deep into it. So, and I'm not that smart. But this is just my take on it. <laughs> But you're, <laughs> I just got to be front with you. I'm not that smart. But, you know, the Bible says that in the beginning... The earth was here, but it says it was without form, and darkness hovered over the face of the deep. I just want to submit that in my personal belief, God for eons of time had, could have been making things and wiping things out. Yeah. Oh, I'll make this, and that's fun. I'm done with it and wipe it out. <laughs> I'm, but I'm serious. But what changed is when he created Adam and Eve and he said, I'm going to make these things in my likeness and I'll breathe into them my breath. And that changed because now it wasn't just a plaything for God and I'll just create some space and I'll do this thing and I'll create a planet and wipe it out and, you know, whatever it is, I'll create some dinosaurs and wipe them out because that's cool. But now he said, these, these things are made in my image. This is something I want to commune with. This is something that I want to fellowship with. I, I love them because they're a part of me. They have my breath and my spirit inside of them. This is worth saving. Amen. Yeah. This is worth redeeming. This is worth doing life with. That's how God looked at humanity. It all changed when Adam and Eve were created. He yeah. says, now this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. When somebody has a baby and they say, well, isn't it cute? And you lie and say, oh, it's the most precious thing I've ever seen. Knowing all well that that's the ugliest baby that you ever set a pair of eyes on. But you dare let somebody look at your baby and say, oh, it's not that cute. Come on, those are fighting words. Why? Because when it's yours, when it's from you and like you, there's something about it that just shifts and says, well, no, 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 now, now this is my baby. This is my DNA. This is of me. And that's how God looked at humanity when he created Adam and Eve and he said, now this changes everything. This, I, if I wanted to, I could just wipe it all out. And even in Noah's generation, when the world was so wicked and so perverse and so evil, it says that he would have just wiped them all out, but he still found some righteous men on the earth that were worth saving. He still made a way. Yep. Everything changed. So we can't separate the people of God and the work of God. Church is meant to be more than just a bonus thing. It's not essential for following God. I can do it in the privacy of my own home. He created you with a body for a reason. 
The church is more than just receiving information and transmitting it into the brain. If that's all we needed to do was just transfer information into your brain, we could skip the buildings and just bring sermons into your home. But we have this because we believe in community. We believe that God has desired family. We believe that even Jesus on the earth, he could have just done it all by himself. But no, he brought disciples with him. We know the 12, but if you actually search scripture, there was a lot of people who followed Jesus. Why? Because he said this thing can't be done alone. Life's meant to be lived in community. We believe that God does his best work in the community of the church. That's why he said, upon this revelation of who he is, he will build his church. So you can't separate the work from God from the people of God. I believe that the church has exclusive rights to what God wants to do on the earth. Listen, I listen to a lot of preachers, but if I'm, you know, sometimes on YouTube or social media, you come across somebody who's preaching and they ain't attached to a church anywhere. They don't have a pastor anywhere. They're just out there doing their own thing. I don't have any business listening to that mix. Why? Because if you can't be connected to the people of God and do life with the people of God, but yet you think God has called you to be by yourself and speak to the people of God? Come on. No, we, we, we are to be a part of the people of God, in life with the people of God, working with the people of God. Why? Because people of God, or the people of God are the work of God. It's what he's been trying to do from the very beginning. And to separate the people of God and the work of God is to embrace a version of Christianity that is unknown to your Bible. Mm-hmm. We are called to be a part of the church. Well, some people say, well, the church is unhealthy. Well, great. Probably so is your family. Probably so is, you know, (laughs) your home some days. But because we're a part of it, it's our job to fix it. Some days, you know, I don't know. I have four young kids all under the age of eight. Some days you just want to be like, this is too much. I'm out. And just, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I was going to say pizza, I don't know why, but I guess I'm hungry. (laughs) Somewhere else other than here. Why? But because they're my family, I'm obligated to stay, to fix it, to work on it, to adjust some attitudes if I got to adjust them. Come on, some parents. But we don't leave and walk away because we're hurt or because we disagree with some decisions that leadership has made. Rather, we're called to be a part of it, to embrace it, to move forward, to do life together. Actually, have you ever stopped to consider how how many of the fruits of the Spirit are relational? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control. I don't need self-control when I'm all by myself. I need self-control when somebody's up in my face irritating me (laughs) when somebody cuts you off come on but that's it's all relational you don't grow in the fruit of the spirit by plugging yourself in you know being independent and just pulling away from you grow in the fruit of the spirit when you do life together and somebody irritates you and god puts somebody beside you on sunday morning that's hard to love oh great this is where i need to learn to love come on he calls us to be in community so we can learn patience And here's supposed to be the place where, you know, when patience isn't being developed, we don't come and just placate you and say, well, you know, just just ignore them. Just do your own thing. No, here's where the church needs to rise up and say, grow in patience. Be mature. Be a seasoned believer. The world won't do it for you. All right. I move on from that. The world just wants to give you a participation trophy and say, thanks for showing up. The church is called to call you to a higher place, a higher level of living. You need people in your life to learn what it is to love even when you don't feel like loving. You need to learn what it is to enter into conflict resolution when you don't feel like resolving the conflict. So much of what God will do in you, he will do in the relationships that you're surrounded in by a spiritual family that you belong to. 
You might say, well, I have friends outside of the church. I don't need friends in the church. Wrong. I've taught you this so many times over the years. It's, it's not that you can't be friends with people outside of the world, but you always have to be careful because their end game is not the same as your end game. That's right. Their end game is, well, I want to die and have the most toys, and I want to die and be the wealthiest, and I want to die and have live life to the fullest. I want to die and stand before my Savior and hear him say, yes. well and done, good and faithful yes. servant, enter into the reward of the Lord. So yes. it's important for me when I'm doing life with other people and I'm running decisions off of other people that I'm not saying, well, you know, my unsafe friend over here, they give me the best advice. Well, but their, if their advice isn't fixed on the word of God and their end game isn't the same as yours, it might be good advice for them. It might cause you to excel in business. It might cause you to learn how to climb the corporate ladder, but it won't get you into the gates that's of heaven. Right. That's so that's right. why, it, you know, we need to have fellowship one with another. Amen. We can't separate the work of God from the people of God. Number two, expand. Expansion is a part of the mission of God. He says, fill the earth, fill the earth. What I want you to take note of here is when Adam and Eve were placed in the garden, notice what he says to them. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Which for Adam and Eve would require eventually, I'm just submitting this to you, leaving the garden mm. yes. to fill the earth. Yeah. They would have to eventually yeah. leave the garden. Now the world was, was not cursed with a curse like it is now, so I'm sure yeah. it was you know, still such a beautiful place, but it would require them to leave the garden. You can't stay in the garden and fill the earth at the same time. Someone has to go from where they are to a new place. That's and that's what it means to follow God. It means leaving where you are and stepping into something new. So we could acknowledge today that the mission of God is, and a part of that mission requires movement. It means moving from here to there. And you understand how this works because, you know, if you're like me and you have a mission or something you want to accomplish at work, uh, you know, I go and make my list. Here's what I got to do today. Does anybody else pre-complete something, but you add it to your list just so you can check it off? Yes. Come on, somebody. Yes. Like, I already did it, but I just need that gratification. Yes. But if you're also like me, you go to clean up your desk and find list after list after list. Yes. Because what you find is making a list doesn't do anything. Movement does something. Come on. Yeah. Movement does something. Activity does something. If we don't act upon the list, we will accomplish nothing. Right. Just submit that to you <laughs> for your next list making. <laughs> it's not enough to desire. It's not enough to want. It's great to write it down, but until action and activity are applied to what you want and desire, nothing will change. Movement always produces results. Movement always produces results. It requires picking up the phone. It requires composing the email. It requires scheduling the meeting. It requires action. The very notion that God has a mission means movement and following God requires action. It requires movement. Even consider when Jesus called his 12 disciples. He showed up on the scene and he didn't say to them, hey guys, believe in me. No, what did he say? Follow me. Don't just mentally ascend, ascend that I'm, you know, the God and I'm the Messiah. Don't follow me. It requires movement. He says, would you walk with me? Would you move forward with me? Where you go, where I go. In life, in following God, there is no middle. There is no maintenance mode. And God said it to even the people of Israel. He said, I set before you life and I set before you death. And he gives them the answer to the quiz. Choose life, right? In other words, he says there's only two paths that we can go on. There's one that leads to life and there's one road that leads yes. to destruction, Psalms 1 tells us. 
And Jesus talks about this even on the Sermon on the Mount where he says there's two paths. One leads to destruction and the other is narrow and it's hard, but it leads to life. So what am I saying? There's no standing still. There's no standing still. You're either moving in one direction or the other. You're either following God or you're not. Following God demands movement. It demands activity. It demands moving forward. Backwards always leads to death. So if we're going to follow God, church, it's going to require forward movement. You have to keep following God step by step. That means following God sometimes will require risks. Why? Because going to someplace new is always risky. It's always scary. I love this in Hebrews 11, 8. It says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going. It would become his inheritance, but he stepped out in faith, following God, not knowing where he's going, not knowing that this would be his inheritance, not knowing what the end would look like. But he said, Lord, if that's where you are, then that's where I'm going. And church, if we want to be where he is, then we have to keep following where he's going. Even when it's scary, even when it's risky, even when it's unknown, we have to keep pushing forward. Come on, if you followed God for any length of time, you, have, you know there are seasons like that where it's like, I don't know where I'm going. I'm just following the Lord step by step, believing that he's leading me somewhere good. Amen. Following God, sometimes the way up looks like the way down. Sometimes the way to life looks like a valley through the shadow of death. But those of us who have followed Jesus long enough know that on the other side of that valley, there's always resurrection. There's always new life. There's always the promises of God. And sometimes he leads us into uncomfortable, even painful, terrifying places. And what does that look like tangibly? Sometimes it means that you have to have a conversation with somebody. Sometimes it means you have to talk about something uh, with a counselor or schedule an appointment or ask for forgiveness or get something right. Or you understand what I'm saying? I, we, we, I'm not just talking about, well, then God's going to call me to pick up my house and move. I'm talking about to move forward. Sometimes it means you have to make hard decisions to get stuff right in here. It means you got to go back into counseling. It means you got to get that relationship right. It means you have to be the first one to call, pick up the phone and apologize. It means you have to be the bigger person when you want to just swoop low and give them every bit of anger you have. It means you have to forgive even when they are continually hurting you. It means that you have to rise above evil and continue to do good in the face of evil. That's scary and that's hard, but that's God. And if I'm not following God, I'm not moving forward. A lot of God's people are stuck and they're stuck in their walk with God because they're afraid to leave where they are. They would rather stay put than risk getting up and taking new ground. I meet so many people who've been saved, let's say, uh, you know, saved for 40 years, but they're not 40-year-old Christians. They're one-year-old Christians who've just gone around the sun 40 times. Yeah. What does that mean? It means they were never willing to move forward. They came to an altar, they got saved, they received Jesus, but they're stuck. They're still bound up inside. They still have every addiction. They still, you know, their mind's a mess. They still, you know, their relationships are a mess. Everything's falling apart around them. Why? Because they're not willing to give up control and follow God into the unknown. Like being humble and being vulnerable. I don't want to be stuck. There's always life on the other side of activity. So we have to live up to the truth of our name, that if we are to remain Hope City, we have to be a place of hope, a place of activity, a place of people moving forward. Standing still only leads to death, but moving forward in God always requires risks. 
Amen? So number three, and this is my final point, is to subdue. Multiply, expand, and subdue the earth. What does it mean to subdue? It means to have dominion over, not dominion in a uh, belittling, warring, pressing down way, but when God speaks to Adam and Eve of subduing and having dominion over the earth, it means he wants them to take, their, take power of their gifts. What does it mean? It means the talents, the resources that God has entrusted them with to bring them to bear, uh, and to bring their gifts and realize certain potential. What do I mean by that? Think of this for a second. Everything that mankind has ever made or will ever make. Think about all the technology from the Great Wall of China to the pyramids to the uh, Martin Rover that, you know, that we, we put on Mars that right now is broadcasting pictures real pictures back to us from 140 million miles away. All the technology, all the advancements that mankind has made. Think of all that we've done. Every incredible intervention, or invention, excuse me. Every advancement in mathematics and science and medicine. All of it, everything that we have ever made, that humanity has ever touched, all the materials and the potential to make it were here from the very first day that God created the earth. From the very minute he breathed life into Adam, all of that was in the earth. It's not like humanity was here and then suddenly some material flew in from space and landed on planet earth and then we found this new incredible material and it advanced our civilization Right? Like everything we've done, we've gotten from what was already here. But it required humans realizing their potentials to carve it out. And that's what God did. He made planet Earth with all of this unrealized potential. And he said, I'm going to make a man who's going to be creative like me with the desire to be inventive and create things and to advance. And I'm going to put them in the earth. And they're going to have dominion over it, which means they're going to tap into that creativity and that potential, and that God part of us on the inside and dream of things and design things and make things. That's why if you look back at Genesis 1 where God created man, do you remember after he created everything else, he says it's good, it's good, it's good. But then he creates man and he says it is very good. Right. Why? Not just because man is this sort of crowning achievement of God's creative power, but it's because we uh, take creative creativity from God. We have the ability, <clears throat> excuse me, to take good and make it very good. Good. Let me give you an example of this. Grain was here when Adam and Eve was created. But I've never seen grains come together and say, you know what, let's bake ourselves until we become this bread, right? Like they don't just come together and make this fresh, buttery, right out of the oven, very good bread from Texas Roadhouse with that incredible... Butter that they have. <laughs> Sorry. Forgot where I was. But I've never heard of that. Because grains don't become bread unless a human being comes along and takes that raw resource and turns it into something very good. Come on, somebody. There's actually a great parable of this that Jesus talks about in Matthew 25, where he talks about the talents. Some of you know, know this story, but the master leaves and he gives one guy five talents. He gives another guy two talents and he gives a third guy one talent. And he says, do something with this while I'm gone. And the first guy multiplies the five into five more. And the second guy multiplies what he has and from two and he has four. But the guy who has won buries it in the earth and does nothing with it out of fear. 
And listen, Matthew 25, verse 24, the, the master comes back and he wants to take an account for what's happened. And he asks the guy who buried it, what did you do? And here's what he says. He also who had received one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you were a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent into the ground. Here, have what is yours. And do you know what the master says to the servant? He actually goes on to say something. He says, I'm going to send you off into the darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. He didn't get a participation trophy. <laughs> he didn't say, I understand fear is a real, real thing. You know, you did the best you could. Right. Right. In other words, God holds us accountable for what he has entrusted us with. Here's what a talent is. It's anything God puts in your hand now that he's going to ask you about later. later. It's whatever he puts in your hand now that he's going to ask you about later. Let me give you some things that the Bible says he's going to ask you about later, just so you're prepared. Your money. Bible says he's going to ask, what did you do with your treasure? Your time. Where was it spent? How did you invest it? Your family. Scripture says, he who does not provide for those of his own house are worse than an infidel and has denied the faith. You have responsibility. He will ask, how is your family? The giftings that he's given you at birth, your potential, the call on your life. All of these are resources that God has given you that when you get to heaven, he's going to ask you, what did you do with what I gave you? Well, God, you know, I had to work, you know, I, I, I had to climb the corporate ladder because, you know, I had to have the newest car and the biggest house. I had to keep up with the Joneses. And God's going to say, not good enough. Yeah. Not good enough. <clears throat> so what do you have in your hand that God will ask us about later? Why? This is a part of the mission of God. We are entrusted with the mission of God. We are entrusted to be a part of the story of God on the earth in this generation, in this time. It's what he's entrusted to us. Here's my conviction for us as a church, and team, you can come. I believe that we've been given so much, so much, even if you could, as a small church, we've been given so much. You know, today we actually celebrate nine years as a church family. Come on, give the Lord a praise offering for that. Nine years as a church family. And over the last nine years, we've been entrusted with much. And what we have done over the past nine years has been significant. How we have loved people and led people is significant. There are many stories that I could give you of people who have walked into this house who have felt like outcasts from either the church at large or just even from the world. And they were loved back to life in this house. How we have always kept the gospel and its power to save at our core over the last nine years is significant. You know, we learned as, as a church when uh, this past summer when we did the Revival If Bible study that the average church after two years sees almost no salvations. Why? Because they, they lose sight of the gospel and the mission of God. This last year alone, we we have had hundreds of people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ by Praise invitations God. that were presented in this room Praise God. through Pioneer Network. It's significant that as a church, we have not lost the power of the gospel because not every church can say that. How we have rallied together over the last nine years to remodel buildings and make the house of God beautiful is significant. 
how we have always endeavored to make our worship pleasing to God, regardless of what the opinions of man may be about it, is significant. There have been many times where we say, well, let's just give in to the pressure and be status quo and not be, you know, too exuberant and be too loud and be too wild. Every church growth seminar that I've ever been a part of always says, just tame it down a little bit and you'll be okay. I would if God just tame it down a little bit. But he's too good. And he's too great. And he's too great that I have no other option sometimes than to lift my hand and to lift my voice and let my worship just make an attempt to glorify the greatness of God. But how we have always kept our worship to God extravagant regardless of the opinions of people. I want to tell you that's significant. We've done well there. How we have endeavored to reach out and simply love our community with no strings attached is significant. How over the last nine years through Hope Weeks, through our Easter outreaches, through fall festivals, through community service projects, through our food pantry, how we've just given and loved people is significant. We've done well with what he has entrusted with us. When COVID hit the earth and we closed like many other churches did, One of the first things we did actually on our first Sunday that we were closed is we designated our entire offerings to feeding kids who had just lost their school lunches. Over the years, I I was thinking back this morning, you know, we have painted and remodeled homeless shelters, projects that were way beyond our ability. I think of uh, Tracy Gardner designing and and painting uh, in... uh, Water Street Rescue Mission, their whole shelter in there. And we're like, yeah, we'll do it. And our teams came together, and we've done that multiple times. We have remodeled bathrooms, we put up fences, we built concrete patios, we painted park buildings, and so much more, all while being a small church. That's significant. We didn't wait to say, well, 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 when when we're comfortable, when the numbers are bigger and the resources are there, then we'll do something. No, we've we've taken what he has given us and we've run towards people. We've been generous with our resources in helping establish and lead other churches when we've had very little resources ourselves. Especially when COVID came, we, we helped multiple churches get online and stream so that their congregations could stay connected to them. Even today, there are many churches who have toured our facility and said, let me just take pictures of everything that you have so that we can get it. We've already done the groundwork of trying to figure out how to do it. Our baptismal was lent out like a used car center, which is great. I love it. Why? Because what he has entrusted with us will be faithful with that's significant. We stepped out in faith with a desire to reach more people in the middle of the pandemic. And against good advice, against education levels, we established Pioneer Network to stream the gospel around the world 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And over the last three, almost four years, that message has been going forward. I was in a chat room just this week asking some creative people their opinion on a a design that we're going to use for Pioneer Network. And and I just put it out there and some random dude was like, hey, I don't know if you already know, but a Pioneer Network already exists. (laughs) He didn't know I was from them and of them. But I just love that just some random dude somewhere else in the world is like, oh yeah, I know Pioneer. We've been faithful. And I'll never forget the first time we ever streamed our service. We had one camera that we had bought five years prior to that from somebody who had given up doing wedding videos and that was used then. And we still have on YouTube, if you go back far enough, our first live stream, the thing was crooked, 
You couldn't see much. It was very blurry. But I said, hook it up. It's what we got. We're going to do it. We've been faithful with what God's given us. And we've missed it along the way. We failed along the way. We have our shortcomings as a church. We have our issues. But here's one thing I know about Hope City Church is that we know how to pioneer again. I'll say that again. We know how to pioneer again. I will never forget the landmark message, the God of what's left. You don't know it, go find it on YouTube. The God of what's left. And when God showed us that when he cuts the tree down, he always leaves the stuff. And he taught us to use what's left We've built our church buildings multiple times over the years. We've had seasons where we've been larger than we are. We've had seasons where we've shrunk back. But God has always said, pioneer again. Lean in again. Do it again. Press in again. And when we failed, we pioneered again. We picked ourselves up. We brushed the dust off of our feet. And we went forward. We moved forward. And church, that's significant. We refuse to get stuck. We have given. You have given sacrificially over the years. Even when it hurt, that's significant. This is just, I mean, I couldn't, I mean, this is just scratching the iceberg of what we've done as a church over nine years. God's done a lot with us. But I say all this to say, And as your pastor, I have to say, we have to keep moving forward. We can't get stuck where we are. We can't stay and say, oh, now we have a food pantry. Let somebody else do that. We're reaching people. Let somebody else do that. It's all happening. We have to keep moving forward. We have to keep investing in the mission of God. I promise I'm closing. In December, I presented a vision for this upcoming year for us as a church. There are some numerical breakthroughs in regards to our average attendance that we have to break through. We have to break through. Why do we have to break through? We just want to fill the seats. No, I don't care about filling the seats. Because there's more ground for us to take as a church. And we can only do it with a stronger family. Are you with me? We can only do it when we're together. There's some vision that God's stirring in our hearts to do bigger and better and grander things to reach our city in bigger ways. And we have to increase our family. So in December, I talked to you about the vision to bring the 500. If you weren't here, let me just fill you in on that real quick. On an average year, Hope City sees around 350 visitors throughout the year. Just, you know, you invited them, somebody invited them, they heard us on social media, around 350 visitors. Year over year, we have grown as a church. Even when, you know, families have gone to other places and have left and our numbers, you know, should shrink. Every year, we've still grown year over year. Even in 2020, we grew as a church. But what we've done was we've taken looked at statistically of, of what we, you know, the percentage of people who visit, because not everybody who comes here is called here. We get that. We might just be a quick stop on their journey to their home. But we have said, here's the, you know, from the, those 350, here's the amount that typically connect with us as a church and stay with us as a church. And to break this next barrier that we need to get over this year, we have a vision to bring 500 first-time visitors into this house. Average, we get 350 without really leaning into it. So we just need to get another 150 people into this house this year. Listen, it always requires action. And now what I taught you today. So what we're doing is in this year, we're challenging us as a church to get real about the mission of God. People are the mission of God. People are the 
people in your world are still hurting and are still dying. And it's our job and it's our mission to reach them. Why? So we can reach more. Do you understand? Do you understand? Hey, we want to reach more so we can reach more, so we can reach more, so we can reach more, so that we can populate the family of God because it's what he's been after from the beginning and it's what he's after now and it's what he's after in the end. He wants people in his family. And as a church, we can't get comfortable. We can't back up. We can't say we're fine where we are. You know, we're just comfortable. Make me feel good. Give me more. Do more for me. No, no, we got to lean into the mission of God and say, God, empower us, grace us with the anointing to reach out and bring more people to share the gospel, to win souls. So we're going to make that a mission this year to bring 500 first-time visitors. I can't tell you how many people have accepted the gospel in this church and they don't come to church here. You know, maybe they live somewhere else and they found a church or they got saved here and they connected with another church that God called them to and that's great because it's not about populating this church but it's about populating the kingdom of heaven with the family that God's desired from the beginning. So if we are a stop on somebody's journey, that's fine. That's fine. So this year we're going to be very intentional about asking what we have said is we want every person individually every person to dedicate to bring 12 people this upcoming year this year 2024 one a month now if you are graced to know a family of 12 you can get them all done just like that but if everybody does their part we'll expand the family of God kids count this year alone you know this past year my son Jeremiah eight years old got saved down in Kid City multiple children got saved in Kid City this past year come on we're winning a generation we're serious about what's happening in Kid City we're not just babysitting them and throwing some crackers at them we might throw some crackers at them too but we're also teaching them about the gospel showing them the power of the Holy Spirit presenting the message of the gospel to them at their age Come on, they count. So what we're saying is, can you dedicate to bring 12 people this year? 12 people. And next Sunday, I'm going to challenge us as a church to write on a little commitment card that's saying, hey, I will bring 12 people. And here's the thing, I don't want you to write when we do this, 12 names, because if somebody says no, you got to replace that name. But just before God, I'm going to keep going. If I invite 80 people or 300 people, I've got to get my 12. Do you, you follow what I'm saying? Is to commit. I'll bring 12 people in, into churches. And then on top of that, I have said, would we commit to giving an offering to the Lord? $10 for each person. So if you're 12, that's $120. And those funds we're going to use not to keep the lights on, not for salaries, but we're going to use those funds to turn around and reach out to more people. You can do that by just saying, hey, here's my $120 right from the top, or you can spread it out $10 a month over the next 12 months. But you do that by just so you know, by marking um, Gather 500 on your giving or outreach, we'll know what that's for. And if that doesn't come to new projects that goes right out to reaching more people. Out of the lobby, we're going to do a count up. For every week, we're going to let you know how many visitors have come so far this year. Why? Because we can't stay where we are. God is moving forward. People will close their eyes on this planet today and be on one of two roads. And the mission of God is for his family to expand. And we're saying, hey, can I invite 12 people over 12 months and give $120 to reach more people over 12 months? That's not a big ask. It's not a big ask. But that's what I'm asking because that's what I felt like the Lord wanted to challenge this with as a church. And I'm believing that by year 10, we break barriers. with me on that? Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you today 
that we understand that your word and your mission is to expand the family of God. And we thank you that we are entrusted with certain resources. We're entrusted with to be the church in our generation. Whether or not a move of God happens in our generation is in our hands. Whether our cities are saved is in our hands. Whether our neighbors come to the saving knowledge of who you are, it's in our hands. It's all in our hands. So we ask you today that this would not be a message that we hear and quickly move forward on. But this is something that we would take heart. Because you, there will be a day where you will look at us and say, what have you done with what I have entrusted to you? What have you done? And help us have a good answer. Help us say, Father, I've multiplied what you've given. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship the Lord together. Feel free to stand if you like.